give the VPs and the entire sales team the tools they need to be successful, measure, measure their usage of them, make sure you're measuring the right things, of course, and then check in. What's your philosophy or your approach to revenue leadership and how has your life impacted that? Well, uh, it's changed over the years as I've learned, right? And, uh, and from, you know, frontline leadership and moving my way up um, where I used to think I, I could get it done myself and I could do it. And my ego was in the front, right? And as I tried to become more of a servant leader, I start, started to realize there's certain things I can't fix. Uh, it's not on me to fix, and it's not very scalable for me to even be involved in fixing it, right? So a lot of it is hiring the right people, and and when you hire the right people, it's just so much easier. I know that sounds so obvious, but so it gets done so you know little, which is really funny to me. Um, where I've had situations where we were having issues with SDRs showing up to work. If you can't even get them to show up to work. <laughs> They're probably the wrong people. You want the people that are pounding on the door at 7.30 to get going, you know, in, in that sort of role. And so I told the leader who was in charge of that, it's like, you obviously have the wrong people, right? And she was just trying to fix them and motivate them the right way. It's like, you know, start over. And so I think as I've gone up in my career, there's been certain things you just got to realize you can't fix. You don't have a magic wand. And that what you really need is strong leadership beneath you and strong individual contributors beneath you. And if, you know, you I want to give everybody a shot. Everybody gets a chance, right? I'm not, I'm not saying just walk through the door and start kicking people out because that doesn't work either. But as a servant leader, you need to realize that your energy is going into them to, to make them better. And if you stay focused on them and, and giving them the tools and the power and the knowledge they need to be successful, right? And looking, and if you're giving them that and it's not working, that may not be your problem, right? That, that's probably a, a people problem, particularly if it's working in other areas. So I think, you know, getting to that point very quickly and realizing that you've just got to have really solid people there. And um, now I also, I tell everybody on my team, you'll never be surprised. And what I mean by that is I'm never going to call you one day and say, hey, you're out. If you don't see it coming, you're blind. I do things like, you know, all the standard stuff, performance improvement plans and, and all that stuff. But I believe in brutal transparency. If I don't like something that's going on and I don't say anything about it, well, that's my fault. This is like with your, your, you know, partner, your, your married, whatever it might be. Same thing. If things are going on that you don't like and you don't say anything about it, it's almost as much your fault as, as it is theirs. So I do believe in brutal transparency and that way people aren't looking over their shoulders all the time. At the same time, when they're fully empowered and you're not talking to them every minute of every day to see exactly what's going on, right? Because they're off doing their thing. They don't, they, they know if you're not happy, you'll call them and tell them that you're not stewing in the background and frustrated by them. I think that gives people a lot of confidence um, and to know that they don't need to be paranoid about what's going on. I think sales people naturally, I think the best sales people I know are naturally paranoid. They're always, you know, worried about what's happening in their deal. What's a competitor doing? What's, you know, who's influencing the deal, that sort of thing. They're, they're really, really worried. So you got to assume they're also worried about keeping their job and what their manager thinks and what the CRO thinks and what the CEO thinks. So I make that pact with anybody who works in my organization that, you know, we will have brutal transparency, which is not always easy to give. And then that, all, that also works both ways. That um, brutal transparency to me is really taking feedback. And it's all fun and games to say you want feedback until you get feedback you don't want to hear. And um, I think for, for leaders, that's the number one thing I, I've seen them struggle with is really getting feedback and doing something about, about it and not being defensive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the way to show them the, 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 the proper way to do that is to accept it myself, which, you know, I, I ask after every sales meeting that I participate in, I send a follow up and say, hey, great, tell me two things I could do better. And they always give you the fluffy, no, 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 no. I mean, really, I want you to think about it. And by the end of the day, I want two areas of improvement for myself that I can do, you know, no, no, no holds barred. And I think that sets the tone for everybody in the organization that if I'm going to take it, they can take it too. And I've got even the internal presentations. I just did a sales kickoff a, a couple of weeks ago and I don't ask it of everybody, you know, they, I pick people out as I go. And I asked an SE, you know, a particular SE who, who's overseas, who's normally pretty quiet. He's a Brit. And I said, you know, I want to hear back from you on, it didn't go the way I wanted. 
I want to know why you think that is that I didn't get, you know, certain points of feedback that I wanted. And he gave me really great feedback and said, Hey, here's what's going on down at the grassroots level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even if I don't do anything with it necessarily or change what I want to do or something, you know, it, I, I can take it and make sure I reward him for having given it to me. So that's a long winded answer to your question, but uh, that's how, that's about, that's how I go about it. It's a great answer. And really this is, uh, the relationship of trust and partnership um that is based on good feedback honest feedback um but therefore it's constructive that's what we're talking about yeah yeah, yeah and, and i'm i make everybody in the organization um at some point I, i'm not all the way through it at the, the one i'm in now but read five dysfunctions of a team okay. if anybody out there's ever read that book i think that's a great one to understand um the concept of healthy conflict that you and I can disagree, even sometimes violently with a swear word or two involved, right? But at the end, if it's coming from a position of trust and and at the end, we usually, maybe we have to disagree and commit, which is the theme in that book, right? Which is, hey, I don't agree with you, but we're going to go forward with what you want because of whatever reason, right? I, I'm going to let you have this one or I'm going to take this one, whatever. And um, I think there's some great tools in that book to help culturally people, uh, you know, get really aligned. That's great. Uh I want to return back to something you said, which is having confidence to know you're wrong and to invite the feedback. Now, for a new leader, I'd imagine this could be a difficult thing to do because we're sure um, we're 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 conscious. We want to be right. We want to do a good job. We want not to fail. We might feel self-conscious about whether we can do this or not. Um, so how have you grown in that regard to being comfortable with being wrong sometimes? What's your personal journey been with that? Gosh, it's been a journey for sure. I think I was that, you know, young buck sales leader that, you know, was going to be commanding control and make sure everything went perfectly and do what I say. And I think it comes with wisdom over time, right? That you, as you get more confident in your abilities, and sometimes the, the confidence comes from, I know I can get another job if this doesn't go well, right? Text wide open right now, everybody, you know, start there, which you don't, doesn't mean you want to go get one. You don't want to start over and do all that stuff. But if, I, if I'm wrong here, it's okay right? That it doesn't expose me or leave me super vulnerable or if it, or if it does leave me vulnerable, that's okay too. Right. And um, so I, for new leaders, I, I would recommend, um, you know, really walking the, walking the talk in, in the trust conversation for sure. Um, focus on developing your people and make sure you're focused on them. Don't worry about above you. If your people are doing really well, that means you're doing really well, which means above you is going to be fine. Right. I'm terrible at managing up. You could ask my boss today or any of the bosses I've had before. They'll all tell you that. Um, and not that I'm difficult or anything like that. I just don't worry about it, you know, as much as some other people probably do. As I worry about, you know, my team. And I know if my team's good, I'll be good, which means they'll be good. And so the other thing I, I also strongly, when you talk about new leaders, this is, I want to circle back to that because it's a, a, a thing you mentioned. There's two kinds of new leaders. There's I've never done it before and I'm new to an organization. Um, there's a, a book out there, uh, again, I'm kind of, okay. Uh, there's a book out there called the first 90 days by Michael Watkins. Some people know it, and, and there's probably 10 others just like it out there. I have all my new leaders who come into the organization, read that book right away. Cause it talks about taking over an organization and how to do it the right way and how to build that trust from the get go and how to, again, listen a lot before you speak, which is probably the number one rule in that book is go learn before you start pontificating. Right. Because you don't know anything yet. And the people beneath you are going to know you don't know anything yet. So there's going to be certain rules and, you know, you know, measurements you want to put in place of, of expectations. That's OK. But, you know, gosh, first, go get some wisdom before you start pontificating. I think it is really important for a new leader is uh, is really be a good listener. Great points uh, and useful if you come from a sales background in that regard as well. Well, yes. Uh, you know, I think that's the number one thing I shift when I when I've come into organizations is discovery, 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 right? A lot of people preach qualification, which is important. But I think discovery in the tech space is more of a team effort, right? That's where you have an SC or sales engineer, pre-sales, whatever involved, and maybe even some implementation folks involved. Or we're learning as a team of, you know, if, if you're patient, they'll give you the answers to the test. Uh, is what I tell them. You just got to be really patient and wait for it. Don't just start running in with your solution and solving their problems when you don't even understand them or fully understand them. And the worst you could do is assume that you understand them. And there's all kinds of, you know, adages on, on assume, but uh, that's the worst mistake. So I really force discovery and I tell SEs, I was a former SE, so way back in my career. So I tell SEs, 
I want you to decline meeting invites if, it, if there's not a discovery meeting for a demo. If it's just, hey, show up and give me a demo, decline it. Don't even, don't even say a word as to why. They should know. Right now, there are certain exceptions where maybe started leading with a demo makes sense just to get some some general awareness. I, I've softened on that a little bit, but generally speaking, the SEs that work for me and my organization are allowed to decline meetings if they're not giving it a, given a discovery meeting first, because we do big enterprise stuff, so complicated stuff, not you know utility stuff. Yeah, yeah, understood. Make sure you're off on the right track. Now, I think this conversation works really well with the VP of Sales piece. Earlier, you said at the beginning of, of your leadership journey, and perhaps many others, perhaps most people, learning to let go is an important step. So the question I have for you, Lincoln, is what's your first test to stretch test a, a, a VP of sales um, and learn a bit more about how they work if they're up to scratch, that kind of thing? Well, um, gosh, that's a real, that's a tough question. Um, mm. Because because it's it's sort of general and what they do and like that that I make sure that they know I don't see them as their team right that they could have they could have a bad team and just have a plan to fix it right and that's okay but learn that first right and then at the same time I expect them to empower their team and let them do things and it's, and children is the same way right you've got to let them fail that's how they learn right don't go and do everything for them. Don't give the sales presentation form every time, maybe the first time, right? But each one of them should have, uh, uh, in, uh, back to the Watkins thing, a 30, 60, 90 day plan, not uncommon in sales, right? And probably in that first 30 days, you're doing it for them. The next 60 days, you're doing it with them. And then the next 90, you know, the 90 day mark, you're watching them do it, right? And you've got to make sure that they're bringing their people through that transition and, and themselves through that transition. And then everything has to be measurable, right? If it's on that plan and it's not measurable, it's not on that plan, right? So do this two times, do that seven times, have this much pipeline, have this many deals, all with numbers involved, and then measure the heck out of that. And then usually by 90 days, the 90 day plan's out the window because everybody's too busy. Um, it's actually a pretty good sign when the, when the plan gets dumped on its head, so. Okay, awesome. It reminds me of something you said earlier, which is, you know, scalable, making, <clears throat> Servant leadership scalable is really important. You can't do that by being heavily involved in everything people do, which is new for me because when I've interviewed people about servant leadership, it's all about having a close relationship and understanding of how that person works. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really interested because this is slightly different, how we do make that scalable, how you've made it scalable. So it's something I have actually been curious about. Well, it, it, it is a bit of a, you know, uh, of a division there, right? So I think there's a difference between having a relationship with them and, and being aware of what's going on and doing the work for them and like standing right next to them and everything they do, that's not scalable, right? But, you know, having really, and almost like some of the conversations need to be about personal stuff, right? And understand, really understand the person and what's going on in their life and uh, particularly around COVID and everything going on too, you know, some of that's really important and it changes the way people behave. And, and so to really scale, I believe it's give them the tool, you know, for me, it's give the VPs and the entire sales team the tools they need to be successful, measure, measure their usage of them, make sure you're measuring the right things, of course, right? Like don't just measure, you know, stuff that's not important, which I think, you know, we get trapped in and, and that's different than every organization. So I don't even have a good example because sometimes the number of cold calls is really important to people. Sometimes it's not. Just kind of. So, um, you know, measure everything. And then check in, right? And but make it really easy. Like have I have a whole you know stack of KPIs that get broadcast to the organization that are red, yellow, and green, right? And if you're red, it's not the end of the world, but you know just have an explanation for it. The other thing I do is I particularly the individual contributors, I have them set their own KPIs. I don't set them for them, right? That's not new, right? The Sandler has trained that for years, but I think psychologically it's really important. And I think you see the Olympics going on right now. And I think it's a good example there. I don't think you necessarily need to tell an athlete how many wind sprints to do, how many push-ups to do, that sort of thing. I think you, you ask the, the athlete, what's your goal? My goal is this. Okay, well, how many of those things, those training elements, do you need to do to meet that goal, do you think, right? And we can have a conversation about it, push back and forth, do the math. In other words, like, you know, if you think you can, if you need 15 deals to make your number, just on average, right, whatever, and somehow you think you can only do two demos in a quarter and still make your number, tell me how that is. 
I'd love to know how that is, but it's probably not the case, right? Like there's some sensibility to it of certain amount of demos, solution presentations, whatever, back all the way to new leads, contacts, you know, uh, um, cold calls and all that fun stuff. So then you can build the way back. But I think them setting them and believing that it's the right number is really important. So in my organization, everybody has different KPIs on all the key metrics that we track. Um, and then they're accountable you know, for, for meeting them. And if they don't, it's like, well, it's your, I'm just holding you accountable to your number, right? That you said, or we agreed to. And I think it's a much more peaceful conversation than you know, the, the dictation of how dare you not make 150 cold calls this week. You know, I've got one rep that has I don't know, he's been here forever. So he has a ton more accounts than anybody else in the organization. He needs to cold call less than the brand new rep, right? So there's all kinds of situations where, where those change. That's awesome, Lincoln. Final question for you then. If you sure. could ask one question to a room of CROs and the best people to ever do it, what would you ask him? Wow, that is a great question. Um, I think it, I think it's how do you, what's the best way to build pipeline? I think that's the hardest thing to do and get right. But once we have the pipeline for, this is me personally, I think maybe it's because I was an SE, I was always better at the back part of the sales cycle than the front part. So I think that's some of my vulnerability and my weakness there, which is why I measure the hell out of that now, because I know how much I hated to do it. So I know that it needs to be looked at because it's tough. And I think that's where CROs could be talking to one another, because I think that's where a lot of the creativity comes in. I think you know, after that, it feels like in, in my space, you know, where I sell B2B, you know, to mid-market enterprise type companies, it's kind of a, just some variant of solution selling or something like that after that, right? You know, we learn about the problem, we show them how we solve it better than anybody else. And then you plan, you know, how to implement it. And then you get the thing closed, right? And you start calling. It, it's some variation of that. But the prospecting and how, that's where the creativity lies of how we get those deals into the pipeline. I think that's always the most interesting thing for me to talk about with other, with other sales leaders.